Hello, I'm Nisha Kumar, Senior Open Source Engineer at VMware, and I spend a lot of time thinking about clouds. And I'm Alan Friedman, the Director of Cybersecurity Initiatives at NTIA in the US Department of Commerce. I spend a lot of time thinking about what things are made of. And so today, we're really excited to talk about what clouds are made of and how SBOM relates to cloud native and modern application development. So it's been a long day of talk so far. So I thought maybe we'll take a break and read some cartoons. Does that sound good? So uh, I want to show two cartoons. Uh, first, perhaps many of you have seen this great XKCD from Random Man Randall Monroe that talks about uh, how when we have our lovely, complex, and ornate modern digital infrastructure, buried deep underneath it might be sort of one weak link or one link that maybe isn't as strong or resilient as we might imagine. And so we're going to address that. We need transparency. And a starting point of transparency is going to be knowing what we have in our supply chain. But I also want to highlight this uh, great cartoon uh, from Rob Lee and Jeff, which talks about uh, the fact that transparency is important, but it's not going to solve all of our problems. Uh, so we don't want to overstate the impact. SBOM and what we're going to be talking about today is the starting point we're going to need to have a lot more. And so today we're going to walk through the basics of SBOM and then highlight what might be coming next. Okay, so today we will be going over some motivating examples for why you would need an SBOM. We make the case for software transparency and why we need that. We talk about why we're not doing these things today. And then we're going to go over some. SBOM basics, and then uh, how do we apply SBOMs to modern applications and some ongoing work that's coming down the pipeline um, to make a more auditable supply chain. And then uh, some ongoing work on SBOM itself and how you can get involved. So let's start with a couple of stories. Um, first, Everyone's favorite thing, let's talk about a vulnerability. Now, this is a recently announced vulnerability. I, I change this slide every month or so because someone discovers something new. Uh, this is uh, something that's buried deep in TCP IP stacks that's used all over the embedded space in IoT and industrial systems, which we know are, are really at great risk. Now, the hard part of this should be uh, the work that the security researchers do to find it. And then folks, of course, have to fix it. But what's always shocking to me is how hard it is for organizations to figure out, hey, do I even have this software? And I'd put it to you that surprisingly few companies or organizations on the entire planet, whether you make software or whether you use other people's software, could actually quickly and easily answer the question, am I potentially affected? And that's perhaps the biggest core aspect of transparency in the supply chain. And SBOM is just saying, hey, is this anywhere on my network? A slightly more nuanced story gets into how do we handle and respond to vulnerabilities. So this is a guy named Shlomi. He's uh, the head of a small research firm called JSOF. Last year, they discovered a uh, vulnerability called Ripple 20, which is also an embedded vulnerability. And he wanted to give his big fancy talk at Black Hat, well-deserved. But before he could do it, he wanted to do the right thing. He wanted to let vendors who might be affected know that they might be affected. But the problem is, today, we have no idea where some of these components are used or even how to reach the people that might be using them. So he and his team had to do OSINT. They had to scour LinkedIn looking for anyone who was bragging about having expertise in uh, this particular software library and then reach out to them and say, reach out to the company and say, hey, we think you might be affected. And by the way, this company in particular, the Fortune 100 company that has real impact uh, in, in, in the world. Let's take a look at a motivating example from the SAS world. And as it so happens, one landed on our lab last month, the recent code cup breach. The long and short of the story is that an attacker was able to grab CodeCov's credentials by taking advantage of an error in the Docker image creation process and used it to modify its bash uploader script. Rather than go for the easy target of uh, knocking uh, CodeCov for not verifying the hash of the script, 
I would like you to consider this Docker image creation error. We're still not sure how exactly the Docker image was built, but we know that build arguments can be passed to the Docker build command line. And here I can speculate that some of those may have been the offending credentials. Either way, not auditing the supply chain resulted in thousands of customer secrets being compromised and some bad press for CodeCup. When you are a SaaS provider and your machinery is compromised, you go down hard. So transparency is something that we have in the marketplace today. Um, and in fact, those of you who come from, have dabbled in economics know that it drives a proper market is when people actually know what they're getting. We see this in areas like safety data sheets in the chemical industry, or indeed the hardware bill of materials model when before you can build something, you need to know what you have it. But let's take the example that a lot of folks know of just you know food ingredient label. So you go to the store and you buy something, it comes with a list of ingredients. Uh, hey, Nisha, uh, you hungry? I sure am. All right, you want a Twinkie? Oh, what's a Twinkie? Well, it's, it's a delicious, non-biodegradable treat. Um, but we can take a look before you decide uh, to figure out if you want it. So are you vegetarian, for example? I'm not vegetarian, but I don't like beef. Ah, well, if we look into our list of ingredients, uh, we find out that Twinkies contain tallow. Do you know what tallow is? I don't. What's tallow? Oh. We'll see, this is an important fact because the list of ingredients needs to also be processable. So tallow is beef fat, which means that Twinkies are not actually vegetarian. Now, for many of us, that's okay. We eat everything. If we're willing to eat the rest of the stuff in a Twinkie, we might be willing to eat the beef fat. But we all know people, and I have friends like Nisha, for whom that would be a big deal or that would be something that they would want to avoid. And transparency here isn't about dictating what's good or bad. It's about allowing everyone to make the right risk-based decisions. And I'd put it to you even more strongly, you can't make good risk-based decisions unless you know what you have. Once we can actually have this layer of data, we can actually build on this and indeed start to make tools and, and have business models that help. So for example, CVE and numbering vulnerabilities doesn't magically fix them. You still have to do the work. But now that we have a way of tracking them, it has created tools and business models and organizational processes to move forward. We want to have a similar vision for SBA. Transparency also helps us understand what's further up the supply chain. So what we want to do is really allow people to have visibility and start to say, hey, what am I actually using? Um, we want to put a little natural selection into this. So there's a, a, a challenge in the software supply chain, in this open source world, this very macabre problem known as the bus problem, uh, where we say, hey, um, how many of the projects that I'm using are absolutely dependent on someone looking both ways before they cross the street every time? So we really need to understand what's in a lot of these packages that we're using. So Supply chains uh, auditing using a bill of materials is not new. Other industries have been adopting supply chain discipline since Deming went to Japan to improve Toyota's car manufacturing process. Software as a profession has not considered enforcing discipline over their supply chain because it's not been this impactful. I think we are now in a place where Toyota once was trying to improve their processes. What this discipline brings to software engineering is security and resiliency. So it's not just CVEs. It's also with SBOM, we have data that we can act on and make decisions with uh, about things like compliance, um, maintainability, and usability. So for example, uh, Nisha, if you're trying to pick between two similar projects uh, for product, something that you're working on, and they're both roughly the same size and the same age, um, but one project has three CVEs against it, and the other project has never had a CV, which one do you think would be the better choice? Well, the ones that don't have the CVE, of course. 
Well, I would have thought so too, because, uh, you know, hey, it doesn't have the security issues. But after talking to people who are experts in vulnerabilities, they'll be very quick to point out that having a CVE isn't a sign that the code's bad. All code, has, especially a large project, is going to have some flaws. What you want is a project that is management that can take the vulnerability information, announce the vulnerability, and fix the vulnerability. So if the projects are pretty similar and one has never had a CVE and the other one has, uh, chances are the management of that second one is actually going to be a little bit better. And so you can rely on them. Just the visibility of management is something that you don't have if you don't have the view further up the supply chain. And ultimately, I think this comes down to the idea that if what you're using is a black box, would you actually trust the product or service that didn't have an SBOM? Even if they didn't want to share it with you, would you trust someone that said, hey, um, I, don't want to, I don't have that information? Would you at least want them to show that they have the information? So if you like this and you're like, hey, Nisha, Al, this is a pretty good idea. Why aren't we already doing this? Well, there's some important things to know, right? There's a little bit of history here. Um, one is that licensing concerns and open source restrictions has traditionally made a lot of people, uh, even some of the most sophisticated companies, a little gun shy um, because a little secret, not everyone always followed the rules when it came to software licensing. I think that's a much better understood risk today. We have commercial off the shelf tools that help people manage it. Uh, the data is available. Every startup that I talk to these days knows that they're going to have to go through an open source audit whenever they reach exit. Um, and we even have international standards uh, like the open chain process that helps organizations manage their open source risk. Another challenge is that this isn't something that can be unilaterally driven. This is a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. No one asks for the data, so no one provides it. No one provides it, so no one asks for it. Uh, that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is how we can find that pump from market perspective. But I also want to acknowledge that it's hard and complex. For this to really work and scale, we need to have enough of a shared view that it can be machine readable. And it's not just a technical issue. We're going to dive into some of the organizational and operational details as well. From a cloud native perspective, the software bill of materials complexity grows exponentially. This is because the ingredients used to create the machinery is complex. Software components often have long dependency chains. NPM immediately comes to mind, but the fact of the matter is a lot of language ecosystems have long dependency chains. It's not the length of the chain that's the problem. It's that the tools do not collect enough metadata to reason about the dependency chain. Developers do not know what their software includes. For example, PIP packages may contain pre-compiled binaries that are required for the Python application to run, but you would never know this because they don't show up when you list all the packages using PIP freeze. The build systems are not reproducible and they're not hermetic, meaning they talk to the internet at build time, thus making the builds non-deterministic. Docker files are a good example of this paradigm. One can pull a pre-built container image based on a tag that may not exist in the future and install software from anywhere on the internet and deploy this container to a private registry. So what is included in this container is dependent on the state of the internet at the time of build. And there are a lot of unknown unknowns things that are private PPAs, non-official package repositories, non-official registries, random URLs. And there's even though there are some canonical repositories that are uh, vetted by the community, there are a lot of artifacts out there that are provided by people on Stack Overflow, for example. So. If this is something we need and we don't have, hey, that sounds like a job for your friends in the government. Uh, and in fact, for the last three years, NTIA, which is part of the US Department of Commerce, that's my office right there on the slide, uh, has been working to bring together the entire software community to make some progress on the basics of SBOM. Now, our approach has been cross-sector. 
What we really didn't want is to have one way of doing things in the energy space and having the elite cloud native people do something completely different and having you know the US government require it a third way. We all use the same software, so we need the same basics, and then we can move from there. It also has to be international. This isn't just, despite the flag, this isn't just an American issue. This is a global issue. Every so often, we remember that there are countries outside the US, and this is very important that we've been getting feedback from our friends around the world in participation. Next, we didn't want to build sort of the perfect ultimate solution because we knew that that would take too long and people wouldn't end up using it. We had to follow, we follow the mantra of crawl, then walk, then run, because we want to make it easy for people to get started. And then over time, we can advance and tackle the more sophisticated cases. We also wanted to try avoid inventing brand new standards. If we're trying to help people adopt things, the solution is to use what we already have rather than to create something new. It has to be modular so that we can slot it in with other efforts. And we want to harmonize these global efforts while still allowing flexibility because different communities, both technical and different sectors, are going to have slightly different needs, regulations, requirements. We want to have the flexibility, but make sure that we're all building on the same structure, the same framework, because we're all using the same software. So let's start out with some of the basics. We've been talking about SBOM now for a while. What the heck's an SBOM? This is a very, very simple illustration of what we're talking about. In our toy example here, Acme application has exactly two dependencies, Bingo Buffer and Bob's Browser. Bob's Browser in turn depends on Carol's compression engine. Now, a couple of things to note here. For each of these components, we might want a lot of data, but the minimum we need isn't that much. What's the supplier, right? What component or repo did this come from? What's the component name? What's the version so that we know if it's up to date or outdated or vulnerable? What's the hash? So that Nisha can feel confident that when I'm using a piece of software, uh, it's not it's it's the legitimate one that we both recognize as canonical, rather than something that I've downloaded from a potentially backdoored site. And then, what's the author of this data? Did this come from me, the developer? Did it come from an upstream source? Did it come from a security tool? The last thing I want to flag here is the explicit acknowledgement of known unknowns, because we know that not everyone's going to have all the data right off the bat. Certain people will be easier for others. Some of the code is proprietary, so you may not have all the data. In this case, we have no idea if Bingo Buffer has dependencies or not. It may not, but it also may have be the top of a very dark tree. By saying we don't know, whoever gets this data can make the appropriate decision. They can say, that's not good enough, give me data. They can do their own risk analysis, or they can say, you know what, that's fine. I'm not worried about the risks here. The important thing is that we're empowering people to make those decisions. Now, how are we going to implement this? We didn't want to create a brand new standard. And the good news is that there are some data formats that can convey this already. Um, the three that the community has settled on as the consensus SBOM standards are SPDX, Cyclone DX, and SWID. SPDX comes out of the Linux Foundation. It's originally developed for licensing, but it has since expanded to cover lots of use cases, especially for security. Cyclone DX is relatively new, comes out of the OWASP world, uh, and it's purpose-built for dependency uh, and is uh, collaborating with other OWASP efforts. SWID tags are the oldest of them. It was originally developed for uh, license management in the commercial space, and it has the advantage of being an ISO standard. These are all great specs, and what we as a community have done has basically, have basically said, let's think about how to interoperate. We've identified the common elements, uh, and we don't think that a multilingual ecosystem will pose too many challenges. And so it's not our job to pick a winner or a loser. We want to promote all of them. And participants in all of these have recognized the value of collaborating together. And so here are the common fields that you can easily translate between them. Once you have the data fields, it's pretty straightforward for computers to do the job. And in fact, there are translation tools already available today. So what about SBOMs for SaaS providers? Do they even need to provide one? Maybe. Maybe not. It depends on the customer. It is easy to assume that it's not required as no software actually gets shipped. However, consider that service providers do take custody of the customer's software and provide all the machinery to deploy it. So with great power comes great responsibility. Customers don't really care about the 
background uh, machinery that providers use, but they do expect that their assets be secured and auditable. And they care about the risk they will be taking by entrusting a significant amount of the business operations to the service provider. So the question a service provider has to ask today is, do you know what you build? Do you know all the cogs in your machinery? You don't need to provide one to your customer. Maybe, maybe not. Depends on the customer. But you do need it for yourself in order to audit your software supply chain. Okay, so at this point, I will tell you not to worry because we can approach this problem by crawling first. So let's crawl. Most of the pieces used to build cloud native applications are using are built using containers. Most cloud workloads are containers. Most cloud infrastructure components are containers. All cloud native applications are containers. If we can create an S bomb for a container, we are off to a good start. But in order to do that, we need to take a step back first to understand what is a container. Now. Containers are just Linux processes forked in their own namespace and with their own resource constraints. We're not going to look at that here. We're going to be looking at container images. These are essentially stripped down Linux file systems broken down into a series of tar archives. This is what a static analyzer that uh, targets container images will analyze. Let's take a look. So. You can imagine a container image as a many layered parfait. The bottommost layer is a Linux file system, which provides some basic configuration and tools. You can use the tools to install system dependencies that are required for your app to work. That makes up the next layer. Then the app dependencies are installed on top of that, and that would make up a few more layers. And then finally, you would add your application at the top, and that would be the next layers. Now, this isn't by design. This is how software installation typically happens on Linux distros. And the layers are just the result of the file system snapshot that's used by the container build tools, such as Docker. So here are some examples of layered containers in the wild. Docker's official images are layered in this way. They do this because they have to support a variety of Linux distros and app ecosystems. Bitnami's images are well-regulated, and they come from a well-regulated container build pipeline. And these are actually one of the images you can find in SBOM in the container file system. Uh, that's how Bitnami has engineered their pipeline. Cloud-native build packs and their Go implementation, which is Paquito build packs, use the build pack specification to maintain a separation between the system and app dependencies. And this allows you to update the layers independently, which is pretty cool. You can get an SBOM for these kind of containers using the pack command line tool. One thing they all have in common is that there is some level of scrutiny and control over what goes into a container build. So you can generate an SBOM reason reasonably well for these images. But not all images are like this. But at least you'll be able to figure out what are your known knowns and what are your known unknowns. The kind of container images that keep me up at night are the ones that I like to call the smoothie. They are heavily processed container images. And they are the result of a multi-stage Docker build and processes used to shrink the number of files in the container image and uh, reduce its file size, tools like Docker Slim. This is actually a best practice for runtime security because you reduce your attack surface. However, it's difficult to understand what exactly you are running as all the metadata in the container image is gone. You can typically find these container images for applications built with Go. Go binaries are statically compiled. What this means is that 
what finally ends up in the container image is an opaque binary blob. You would be lucky to be able to find a list of GitHub projects that were involved in the creation of the blob, but you would be hard pressed to find the exact source code. Here's an example of a Kubernetes container. So this is the container autoscaler, the cluster autoscaler, sorry, which is which has one layer, which is the slim down distroless OS, and the binary blob on top of it, which is the cluster autoscaler. And this is what your static analyzer will find. Some static analyzers will be able to read the strings, and they'll find a list of GitHub URLs that went into building this binary blob, but not the actual source code. And this may be reasonable if the release machinery was deterministic. Kubernetes SIG release team have done great work in making this process more deterministic. Kudos to them. But in general, not much information about the build is transferred to the container image. Tracing back to source code is non-trivial. You will just have to trust the organization that built this. More seriously though, if the build is not repeatable, that is, you can't recreate that container image, from the same tag release on GitHub, you're stuck with a stale container image. And these do exist in the ecosystem. All right, so having said all these, what tools are available that you can use right now to build uh, and generate s bombs for container images today? There are three tools I'd like to highlight. OWASP's, dis OWASP's dependency track tool will list the source code dependencies, and it also supports importing uh, S bombs in the Cyclone DX and SPDX formats. Turn, which full disclosure is a project I maintain, finds package metadata and container images built with Docker, and if you're using Docker files, and they generate S bombs uh, in the SPDX format. And the last one I'd like to highlight is SIFT, which is a tool built by Anchor. And it finds package metadata and container images, and then generates SBOMs for container images in the Cyclone DX format. And it also has support for another tool that has a vulnerability uh, analysis called Gripe, which is also built by Anchor. Now, don't get too excited because this is actually not enough to provide software transparency for the whole supply chain. This is just a starting point. If you want to have a more auditable supply chain, you need to have SBOMs for the components that you include in your software factory. Things like the build tool chains, for example, the compiler that was used to create the binary, build stages, all the containers that go into CI CD pipelines, configuration, what kind of environment variables you set in your larger environment and uh, what you pass to the build, secrets management, uh, there really isn't any work uh, going into how secrets can be passed between containers and into uh, build environments. Signatures, where do you store them? How do you uh, manage them? Where do you update them? Um, and attestations for each stage in the build and the verification of those attestations. So while there's a lot that we're looking forward to to build in the future, there's still some engineering problems we're trying to make sure that we can handle for things to be able to scale today. So, for example, uh, naming is actually a non-trivial problem. Uh, in some cases, it's fairly straightforward, right? If all of your work happens in the domain of a package manager, then you're great. A lot of the value of a package manager is it creates a localized namespace. But we don't have a global namespace for software. You know, do we use com.sum.java or com.oracle.java? Well, it just depends on when you start keeping your records. Uh, so there's some advice uh, that the SBOM community has published that basically amounts to, dear God, 
Never invent your own name string uh, to describe a piece of software. Let's use other things that are there and use an established naming format. Uh, package URL is one of the more popular ones. There's also a project in Europe called Software Heritage ID, which is trying to solve a similar problem. Um, if we are interested in providing SBOMs downstream, how do we actually deliver them? In some cases, it'll be fairly straightforward. If we're dealing with open source, then just keep the metadata in the repo. If you're dealing with shipped on-prem software, well, then we can say, hey, you know what? Just put the metadata next to your blob. If we're dealing in a SaaS environment, we actually need to be a little bit creative about this. Uh, and we've broken the issue down into discovery. How do I let uh, the user know that it's there? And then access, because maybe I'm only willing to let certain people access this or certain customers or certain licensees to access it rather than um, make it public. And so we want to be able to use existing access control streams as well. And by the way, for embedded systems, it's even harder uh, when we talk to folks who are in you know, operational technology or healthcare, well, then they say, hey, I need the data to can't follow the device because I'm not going to let my scanner on these uh, non-IT networks. So we're working on some great solutions in that front as well. And the last challenge I want to flag is the idea that not all vulnerabilities are actually uh, put users at risk. In fact, if you go by some metrics uh, from some vendors and some experts, it's a very low percentage, uh, below 10%. And so what we need to do is acknowledge that because as more people start tracking this data, uh, it's going to increase the number of false positives. And what we want to do is we acknowledge that security resources are quite scarce is to make sure we can prioritize what we should be paying attention to. Even when it comes to things like code refactoring, we, we have a, a priority list of which we want to adjust first. So one of the things we're building into the supply chain is the ability for a project or a product to communicate downstream, this vulnerability does not affect me. I am asserting that. So if you trust that, if, the op if an open source project says, hey, we use this component that's got a vulnerability in it, but it doesn't affect us and we've done the legwork. If you trust the maintainers of that project, you can then say, okay, this is safe to ignore. And then you can communicate that downstream to your customers. We're using this on an Oasis project called the Common Security Advisory Framework. Uh, and we're calling this, not the greatest name, the Vulnerability Exploitability Exchange or VEX. So I wanna close uh, by trying to underscore a point that SBOM is coming. We're seeing a lot of government activity and interest in this. Uh, started in medical devices. The regulator in the United States for medical devices has basically said, we're going to be requiring this uh, for new medical devices. Many medical devices have cloud or SaaS components, and they're also worrying about that. We're seeing a spillover into other areas, uh, into automotive and uh, energy and electricity. Um, we're also seeing this coming in more and more standards and guidance. So for example, uh, here are two standards that have been issued by ENISA in Europe. Uh, one of them is for IoT devices, but even more noteworthy is uh, the standard on the bottom applies to cloud service providers. And one of the things it asks is, hey, can you track this? But a substantial level is, do you have a formal SBOM? More generally, I think we're going to see more people starting to ask for this. So for example, in the electricity marketplace, uh, the Edison Electric Institute, which is a trade association of um, uh, publicly traded utilities, has started to introduce guidance for their members to say, hey, whenever you buy something, ask for an SBOM. Uh, we're going to see more and more people asking you about this. And as we talked about, we want to make sure that you're empowered to give them an answer. Even if it's not, I will give you one, you should be able to say, I have one. And then lastly, how does SBOM fit in with a lot of the other efforts? Nisha highlighted a bunch of different related projects that we're seeing across the ecosystem uh, that are pulling in more data. SBOM is going to be part of that. It's not going to be the whole solution, but it is, it, going back to our, uh, our grocery store analogy, it's part of that healthy breakfast. So where are we today? Uh, some organizations, starting to creep into many organizations, can already produce at least partial SBOMs. Uh, and this includes folks from a different range of actors. It really is just a matter of a lot of these uh, organizations have the good hygiene today. So you can think of this as a hygiene approach. The goal of this broader SBOM effort, which is bringing together different approaches, both inside NTIA and in parallel efforts, is 
one, let's make SBOM generation easier and cheaper and more scalable. So what can we do? What are the obstacles that you have to do this today? How do we help with that? Two is we would just want to spread the word. We want to make sure that uh, there's an expectation in the marketplace because that's really what's going to drive it. And then lastly, we're not interested in transparency for its own sake. We want to make sure the data is useful and can actually help people verify that they've got good security and make good risk-based decisions. Moving forward, we're going to need your help. This needs continued industry leadership and expertise to guide investment and standards and practices and public policy around the world. So we hope you reach out. There's some fun resources that are available, including something that uh, Nisha just uh, was talking about. The CNCF's uh, security supply chain technical advisory group is doing a lot of work in this space, including their list of supply chain compromises that you can take a look at. They've got a whole list of supply chain compromises dating back to 2003. Um, you can get an idea of how the compromises happen and what you may be able to do in order to prevent those. Uh, they have a talk that they gave at KubeCon EU just recently, a couple of months back, um, that's called How to Prevent CNCF Gate. You can, uh, there's a link to that in the slides over here. And Watch out for a software supply chain white paper that the CNCF is working on and will be publishing soon. So if you're interested in some of the cross-cutting basics around SBOM, uh, I encourage you to go to ntia.gov slash SBOM. That has a set of resources that will help you depending on what level you're interested in. There are some introductory approaches, including some things that are aimed at helping executives understand it. There's an SBOM at a glance paper. Uh, there's an FAQ that can walk through some of the common questions. For example, Nisha, do you think SBOMs help attackers? Hmm, I don't know. Do they help attackers? <laughs> I, we don't think they do. Uh, because we think advanced adversaries don't need it because they can find this information out. And automate adversaries that are using automated attack tools don't care about your SBOM. They're just using automated scanning tools. So rather, we think of an SBOM as a roadmap to the defender rather than a roadmap to the attacker. Um, if you're interested in getting involved in this global SBOM process, uh, go to ntia.gov slash software transparency. Uh, Will you'll find a lot of information, including some of our past uh, meetings and presentations, but also information on how to get involved in some of the working groups. There are folks thinking about this from an architectural level and how do we reconcile SBOM with some of the more advanced tools that Nisha has been talking about. There are folks explicitly focusing on tools. Uh, so how do we uh, and, and how do we implement this in the data formats of SPDX, Cyclone DX, and SWID? And of course, there's another working group that's just focusing on uh, awareness and adoption, how to get this out. We also have proofs of concept work happening in different sectors today. Uh, so we have some work happening in the healthcare sector, not necessarily one of the vanguards of cybersecurity, but they're leading the way on this. Uh, the automotive sector and the electricity sector have also been making a lot of progress to show that this is possible. So if you want to get involved, there are some resources, or you can reach out directly to me, uh, and I'll talk to you more about SBOM, probably far more than you want me to. And if you have any questions about tools and processes and what tools are out there and what the actual folks who are deep down in the DevOps weeds like I am uh, working on and problems that we're trying to solve and need, need help on, uh, you can reach out to me. My handle is at Nisha KMR on Twitter. Um, and with that, thank you for watching. I'm Nisha Kumar. And I've been Alan Friedman.